Well, you all got quiet. It must be time to start. <laughs> Good, morning. Good morning. A beautiful July Sunday, and I am grateful and glad to welcome us all into the presence of God with rejoicing, with hope, with grace, with mercy, with all of our whole selves as we come into this physical space, as we are in our online space, may our worship today be a beautiful offering in each and every facet. The offering of relationship and connection to each other, the offerings of our singing and, and my preaching and our prayers, may it all just waft heavenward to God. I don't have a bunch of announcements or anything, so let us just be about what we have come here and gathered to do. Let us draw nearer to God through our prelude. Please stand and join me in the call to worship. Heaven is declaring God's glory. The sky is proclaiming his handiwork. One day gushes the news to the next, and the night informs another what needs to be known. Of course, there's no speech, no words. Their voices can't be heard, but their sound extends throughout the world. Their words reach the ends of the earth. The Lord's instruction is perfect, reviving one's very being. The Lord's laws are faithful, making naive people wise. The Lord's regulations are right, gladdening the heart. The Lord's commands are pure, giving light to the eye. But can anyone know what they've accidentally done wrong? Clear me of any unknown sin 
and save your servant from willful sins. Don't let them rule me. Then I'll be completely blameless. I'll be innocent of great wrongdoing. Let the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing to you, Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Please stay standing and join me in our hymn of praise, Forgive Our Sins as We Forgive, number 390 in the Red Hymnal. be seated. <laughs> Please join me in the opening prayer. Provoking God, calling us through the face of the other, free our fickle hearts from our need to divide and exclude the foreign and the misfit. Lead us through the storms of rage to a clear and new beginning through Jesus Christ, whom hatred cannot touch. Amen.
Thank you, Barb. I'd now like to ask you to join me in our mindfulness for this morning. Um, just, I think you probably know the drill by now. Get comfortable, close your eyes, relax. Oh, I guess I start with that, sorry. <laughs> Sit in a comfortable position, close your eyes, and take three deep, relaxing breaths. Open your awareness to the sounds in your environment. Come into the present moment by listening to whatever presents itself to your ears. Form an image of yourself sitting in your seat. Note your posture as if you are seeing yourself from the outside. Now bring your awareness inside your body and note the world of sensations occurring there in this very moment. Now feel your breathing wherever it's most obvious for you. Pay special attention to every exhale. And when you are ready, you may calmly and slowly open your eyes. There was, was there a backside? There's a backside. We'll close our eyes and resume breathing. I'm so sorry, I will get this right one day. Replace your exhale with a loving kindness or self-compassion phrase. May I be safe. May I be happy. May I be healthy. May I live with ease. May I be peaceful. May I be kind to myself. May I accept myself as I am. May I forgive myself. May I see my beauty. For the next few moments, slowly repeat the phrases, returning now and again to an image of yourself sitting in this place, in this moment. and gently open your eyes. I'm sure that for some of you, uh, that time of Mindfulness may feel a little foreign or a little different, but I thank you for just going with the flow. It's only for six weeks if it's not your thing. And I hope that what you're experiencing, whether it's your, normally your thing or not, uh, is similar to what I'm experiencing, to take time to breathe and check in with our whole selves in the midst of God and God's people, I know I find another little moment of chill uh, in the midst of worship, and it's my hope that it can do that for all of us. But now, with one voice, let us join together in praying the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom 
and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, now I would love to have my kiddos come forward for the children's message. says, the perfect answer of a helper. I know, we do have a whole floral situation up front here. And vibrant colors, and it's all good stuff. Well, hey. Uh, so today, we've been talking about feelings, and today, we're going to talk about anger. Anger shows up when something goes wrong. Have any of you all my grown children. Have any of you experienced anger when something goes wrong? Never? Parker says never. I'm, gl I know, I'm glad your life is perfect. All right, do you want to come like squeeze in between me and Leah so you can see the pictures? Because I'm not going to be talented enough to turn this book around. Can you see, Joey, anything you want to see? All right, so anger. The first thing he says is, hey, what are you looking at? Fine, I'll introduce myself. I'm anger. You aren't going to get all touchy-feely now, are you? If anybody wants to look at this, it's really cute afterwards. Oh, I hate it when people say weird things like, don't have a cow. Why would I have a cow? What does that even mean? Don't lose your temper, they say. <laughs> well, don't worry. I haven't lost it. It's right here. Where do you keep your temper? You keep it at 514? Okay. I love that. I, I thought we would. That's excellent. Anger says, I like to honk my way through the traffic jams of life, and I make sure we get our head in the game. I've perfected the art of stomping and glaring just in case anyone tries to put us in time out. Time out? Yeah, I don't think so. I, yeah, I thought you might like to see it. Because, uh, you know, I, that's okay. I love that they are not exhibiting anger. You know, I mean, brothers, things happen, so. Yeah. <laughs> but if there's one thing that burns me up more than sunsets, more than scented candles, it's putting vegetables where they don't belong. Broccoli on a pizza? Did you think I wouldn't notice? And then disgust shows up and says, Ew, that's not food. Oh my goodness. I'm tired just reading Anger's book. Did you, does, when you're angry, does it ever make you tired? Does it kind of take a lot of energy to be angry and stomp around and be in a bad mood? It does. Anger is one of those emotions that takes a ton of energy. And that is nice and bouncy. And sometimes, I'm going to give you a little pro tip, okay? This is just a secret between me and you, right? Often, when we feel anger, anger is protecting us from feeling a different emotion that's inside of us. A lot of times when we are stomping and angry, sometimes we're actually tired, sometimes we're actually embarrassed, sometimes we're actually sad. Um, so hungry, oh yes, that is a, I'm the queen of being snippy when really I need a Snickers. And I mean, if you've seen the commercial, yeah, now you're thinking about Snickers. But yeah, so, a lot of times when we're angry, it's a good time for us to use those brains in our noggins. You have a brain in your noggin? Yeah, of course you do. You have a brain right up here in your noggin. It's in there. I can hear it slopping around. <laughs> I was just teasing. I can't hear it moving around. But yeah, let's see if I, I'll talk in the microphone if I get really close to your mouth. And, but really, anger, is an emotion that tells us a lot. So when anger shows up, 
You pay attention, okay? Let's pray. God, you are so, so good. I do ask that whenever any of us, the child inside all of us, whenever we feel anger, may we honor anger and recognize anger and ask our anger, hmm, is there anything else going on so that we can really deal with all of our feelings? And God, I always just ask all your mercies and blessings and, and goodness and protection to surround our children, the ones who are here on the chancel this morning, the ones who I know some folks are traveling and doing other things. I just pray for you to be with each and every one. And also, I mean, God, the children we do not know, we really, we pray for the children. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, friends, you can go back to your grown-ups. And now, church, would you join me in our offering prayer? We present these gifts, O oh God, in the confidence that healing, hope, and wholeness will flourish through them and because of them. Amen.
And now, let us sing together freely, freely. It's in your red hymnal, number 389. ourselves within our six-week series on building empathy. We started off on June 23rd with empathy, focusing on the fact that it's a skill, not a gift. Then last Sunday talked about self-empathy. This week is one-on-one -on -one empathy for others. And I'm just really, I think it's going to, I feel good about Jesus today. I just, sometimes you know the Lord just handed you a word, and I hope that from my heart to yours, that, that it blesses you as it blessed me this week. I also want to mention, um, we're going to have guest speakers the next couple of Sundays, and my family is actually going to be cruising to Alaska. So... I generally don't let you all know when I'm going to be gone, gone, because, you know, when the pastor's away, the people will stay in bed. But, <laughs> but I am telling you, friends, if you are not out of town or infirmed, the guest speakers the next two Sundays, I already had an email from Garrett Forrest, who is speaking, preaching next Sunday. He has graduated recently from the U of I. We have a bio that will you know, that he's already uploaded. He's using Planning Center and like has all the things to me. He is a preacher's kid. Uh, he is kind of one of our own in the conference and he is a delightful young man, one who inspires me with hope for the future of United Methodists, particularly in our conference and in our part of the world. So with true, just full authenticity, I say, you are not going to want to miss being here and hearing him and supporting him, cheering him on as one of our United Methodist young people doing great good uh, in the world. And then on July 21st, can't get better than one of our own, Sean Rankin uh, is going to be, she's a mental health professional, and so she's gonna be sharing some of her expertise with us, and she is so passionate. And she has transformed some of our knowledge through our discipleship class and that kind of stuff and so now she has a chance to share some of that passion with you all 
you will not want to miss it. I mean, obviously you can, can check it out and worship online, but really, if you're around, be in the space to absorb what these beautiful folks have to share. And then I'll be back in the pulpit on July 28th with Practice Makes Perfect. By then I might be feeling very, you know, in my Disney sauce even deeper, it might turn into Mary Poppins, practically perfect in every way. Who knows? <laughs> okay, quick reminder, just so that in case you haven't heard the other messages, our baseline is that empathy is a skill, not a gift. It can be cultivated if our skills are lacking, and it can be regulated if we empathize beyond what is healthy. And as we come to this message, I do want to share, I've been sharing some assumptions, um, and I'm going to do that again today. So just quickly, four assumptions that I bring into uh, this space. First, I assume that practicing empathy eyeball to eyeball with another person is improved by being in touch with our own feelings. That's why we've done this in a particular pattern. I uh, wanted to talk about self-empathy before one-to-one -one empathy to start cultivating those interior skills. Second, practicing empathy will more often than not include discomfort on the part of the practitioner because empathy is practiced in the me messy moments of life. Thirdly, when we practice empathy, we will do it poorly sometimes, especially if it's a brand new skill. And when we get it wrong, we apologize, we learn, and we do better next time. The last bit, the last assumption I'm making is that empathizing with another person, it's always about them in that moment, not about me or the self. But let us go now to Mark's Gospel, chapter 8, verses 22 to 25. Jesus and his disciples came to Bethsaida. Some people brought a blind man to Jesus and begged him to touch and heal him. Taking the blind man's hand, Jesus led him out of the village. After spitting on his eyes and laying his hands on the man, he asked him, do you see anything? The man looked up and said, I see people. They look like trees, only they are walking around. Then Jesus placed his hands on the man's eyes again. He looked with his eyes wide open. His sight was restored, and he could see everything clearly. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So I chose this moment in Jesus' public ministry as our grounding space for talking about this one-to-one -one empathy. As you heard in my assumptions, I do like to call it eyeball-to-eyeball -eyeball empathy, but given this text, it seemed a bit pun-heavy to uh, lead with that term. But why would eyeball-to-eyeball -eyeball empathy be meaningful to me? I think this particular phrasing and notion took root for me when I learned from Trisha Hersey, the nap queen, that one form of rest is an extended gaze into another person's eyes. It is powerful. Looking into someone's eyes is an interpersonal connection that will often cause us to feel our shared humanity. Now the truth is, most of us are super awkward in our own humanity. And because of that awkwardness in our own humanity, encountering another person in their moment of pain or loss or disappointment or frustration, it causes us discomfort. And I mean soul-itching existential discomfort. I'm not saying that our discomfort is some sort of shallowness on our part. So instead, when our soul becomes itchy, instead sometimes of practicing empathy, even if we know it in our brains, we want to short circuit that feeling, and so we say or do what will bring us back into comfort 
or a reasonable facsimile of comfort. So this discomfort might present itself in the moment as feeling at loss for what to say or do, or even just feeling inadequate in the face of the situation. I mean, I suspect that that's an experience most, if not all of us in the room have had, where your friend, your somebody, is going through something, your neighbor, your classmate, and you just, you don't know what to say or do. You feel inadequate. Well, one of the things we can draw on as people who are in touch, who within whom the Spirit of God dwells, is that we can tap into that same spirit of compassion and consideration that accompanied Jesus in his ministry. I really just want to walk through and, and just really consider our scripture lesson for today. As we start out, we learn that some people brought a blind man to Jesus and begged him to touch and to and heal him. So the people, whoever they were to the man, we don't know, were they friends, family, community, caretakers, we don't know, but people connected with the man, showing their empathy, I'll, I'll note, and then they came to Jesus and they begged for a healing touch. Now we know from other parts of scripture that Jesus' intention and touch are not a formulaic necessity for healing, yet in this story, in this moment, in this man's life, this touch becomes integral to the connection and the unfolding of restoration. So then it says, taking the blind man's hand, Jesus led him out of the village. So Jesus took his hand and led the man out of the village, and I would suggest also then, out of the spotlight. This was not one of those times that Jesus was going to perform a miracle for some kind of proof of divinity. Jesus chose to care for this man more intimately. And when we practice this eyeball, one-to-one -one empathy with another person, it is not for applause or profit or reciprocity. Remember, please, from the first week of the series that my biblical premise is that empathy is one way of living out Galatians 6.2, which says, carry each other's burdens, and so you will fulfill the law of Christ. And so here we have Jesus and the man outside of the village and out of the spotlight, and Jesus spits in the man's eyes. Now, friends, I do not recommend this as a first step in your empathy endeavors. Sometimes what would Jesus do does not apply. And while I am not ridiculous enough as a preacher to think that this story was included by Mark in his gospel in order to illustrate my point about the awkwardness of empathy, I'm still going to point out that making a truly vulnerable, empathic connection with someone might feel about as comfortable as being asked to spit in their eyes a few times. But then the gospel goes on. After spitting on his eyes and laying his hands on the man, he asked him, do you see anything? The man looked up. And he said, I see people, they, they look like trees, only they are walking around. So this is a man who could see before. This is not like the man blind from birth. This is a man who had been able to see before and, and is seeking restoration. But, you know, Jesus didn't get it quite right the first time. And like Jesus, we might not quite get it right the first time because we practice empathy in a relationship. I mean, Jesus needed to ask the expert in his condition whether or not there had been improvement. And aren't we all really the experts in our own human condition? And so, because we don't get to practice empathy in a vacuum, we just stick with it in openness and sincerity. And so what did Jesus do? He placed his hands on the man's eyes again. And then he looked with his eyes wide open. His sight was restored, and he could see everything clearly. 
Now as we lean in and eavesdrop on this private moment between Jesus and the man, I don't know what it brings to you. It can bring a lot of different feelings, but the interaction itself just gives me those warm, fuzzy Jesus feelings. For what it's worth, my own faith was born because when I was young, I met in the pages of scripture, the Christ who connects with people in their blindness, in their neediness, in their arrogance, in whatever their situation might be. I met the Christ who is not afraid to have his day interrupted and to use a little spit or elbow grease when necessary. And then as I see it unfolding kind of in a different perspective, kind of how you picture things and you have this theater in your mind and the story of the gospel unfolds in the theater of my mind, I see Jesus not really just like, you know, spitting in the man's eyes. That might be what happened, but that's not what I see. What I see and envision is Jesus doing that like parental spit and wipe It's the human version of other animals who simply lick their babies clean, maybe. Um, But for real, I see Jesus wiping the spit onto the man's eyes. Maybe it was holy and magical, or maybe it was to soften and loosen and remove the eye crusties that the blind man had on his eyes. And rubbing it away gently with his thumbs. And then that second go around, the man opened up his eyes and he could see clearly. So I feel this interaction just really lining up beautifully with the practice of empathy because empathy is always personal for the practitioner and the one who is receiving, who, you know, who's going through the tough moment. So it's always personal. It should be gentle. And on our very best days, our empathy just might restore something that has been lost. Amen. In a moment here, we're going to share in communion a touch, a taste. Perhaps one of the powerful realities of this practice as our sacrament is the opportunity at times to walk away feeling and knowing that we have been, at least a little bit, restored. Let us prepare. I see our, I see that our ushers are back there. If anyone wants the prepared cup and didn't grab one on the way in, Tom has those and will come to you. Uh, Others will be welcome to receive by intinction after we are done with our preparations. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. You prepare a place for us. We refuse your invitation. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Your table is open to all. We keep it for ourselves. Christ, have mercy. Your welcome is wild. We are caged by fear. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory Glory to God. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. 
Eternal God, in the abundance of your love, you have caused all things to be. From dust and spirit, you have woven our humanity. In all our wanderings, you never cease to call us to fullness of life. You gave us Jesus, the bread of life broken for the world. He fed us and feasted with us. His dying and rising have set us free from the poverty of sin and the famine of death. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. We ask that your Holy Spirit will fall upon us and upon these gifts, that these fragile earthly things may be to us the body and blood of our Lord and co-heir, Jesus Christ. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples, and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. As on that night, so here and now he offers his presence beyond all that words can hold. In union with Christ's offering for us, now may we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Therefore, in our sharing in bread and cup, we are filled with the life-giving presence of Christ. And we join in ministry alongside him, transforming poverty into plenty in the reckless generosity of love. Inspire us with hope that one day death and greed will be no more and people without number will come to share this meal. We ask this through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, God of blessings, now and forever. Amen. Amen. To those receiving the prepared cups in the pews, the bread in the cup is given for you. Amen. Amen. And if I could get two folks to serve communion, Leah and Barb look ready. Um, I would appreciate that help. So you can have whichever element you like. Got the little tongs there. I'm just going to go ahead and bless myself. As soon as they are in place down at the floor level, I welcome all who wish to receive to come and, and do so. And of course, the prayer rail is always open. Amen. <laughs>
Would you join me in this prayer after communion? Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit to share our lives with others. Amen. And now if I may take just a brief uh, moment of if we were in parliamentary procedures, a brief uh, moment of privilege. Uh, I don't like to air my own personal stuff. The worship is not about me, it is about the Lord, but as I am your shepherd and your leader, and you saw me seated and asking for extra help today, I just want to let you know that in the big scheme of God's good life, I am okay. Uh, my, it is well with my soul, but my long COVID is continuing to cause my body to deteriorate, and the pharmacy has not had my medication this week, so um, some medication that really helps me function, uh, I have not had, so I'm feel, I feel very weak. So I'm ambulatory, but weak. Um, and in the month of June, and it started affecting my ability to have enough energy to do things like go to the hospital as often as I would because it is an amount of movement. Uh, so just be aware that I'm gonna, I have an, a row later coming on tomorrow. Amazon is good. And so I am adapting to my new reality and those kinds of things, but I felt that it had affected my ability uh, to do my work in the capacity that I would prefer enough that I will gladly receive your prayers. Aunt Ruth, if, go ahead and put it on the prayer chain. Or, you know, that I don't know. I mean, I don't, I don't think there's a cure out there, and I'm not complaining. But as we do this together, it would be unfair of me to care for all of you and not let you also pray for me and, and care for me in, in appropriate ways. So. Thank you. And oh, I got that out before I'm going to sit down and let you sing the gift of love. So stand as you are able and sing number 408 in that red hymnal. <laughs> Thank you. 
go into this beautiful day filled to overflowing with the love of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And God's people said, Amen. Amen.